The finder this morning says troubling education statistics. Uh, that's the big one on the finder. Daily graphic, government can sack CEOs. Supreme Court declares. Uh, the Daily Guy says Canadian girls kidnap Storm Kumasi. Uh, if you take a look at the BNFT, local insurers face tough header. Uh, if you go to some other newspapers, sacked GEP deputy CEO, keeping official laptops. We'll talk about it. President Mahama says we uh, deliver on our promises. We'll talk about those issues this morning. My guest to do the talking, a deputy communications member of the, did I say deputy? No, you're a member of the NPP communication team. Eric Tum is here. Good morning. Good morning. I Mike. hope you're doing great. I'm doing fantastic. And thanks for your time. Member of the NDC, former uh, deputy minister, uh, Felix Kwachu, for you. So you. Good morning, too. Yeah, hope you're doing great. Yes, I am. Le let's but you left out one of those uh, designations. I'm not sure. No, no, I don't. I don't, <laughs> no, I don't you see, uh, Felix is beginning yeah. mischief this morning. No, no, it's not mischief. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not in this one information. It's an important. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, yeah, it's, true. Yes. it's true. It's an important government. He official. speaks for the Ministry of Information. Yeah. But so let me get you the chance to clear this. Now, another report is suggesting that uh, two former deputy CEOs of uh, Ghana Export Promotion Authority um, left with the official laptop uh, 16,450 for their personal use. That's according to an audit report. And so uh, the report mentions uh, Eric Chuma Mwako and Akilu Saibu. Uh, According to the 2018 audit report before Parliament, uh, the GEPA was compelled to buy new laptops for their replacement because the two refused to return the MacBook Pro. You refused to return it? <laughs> anyway, good morning. Good morning to yourself, to Felix, and um, to all the viewers out there. I mean, um, I've also seen the, the audit the report. report. Um, I had an opportunity to speak to the Auditor General, I think, once or one of his reps uh, regarding this matter. Uh, but then at the time, uh, I think that uh, a special audit had been uh, commissioned and all manner of, um, I think, that allegations had been made. Mm. Now, um, so it was imperative that you keep the repository that would be able to uh, give documents and even evidence as opposed to what is being um, leveled against you. Uh, so my position was that uh, because at the time I joined, uh, one, there was no official uh, email at the time because we had moved to a temporary uh, location. I had to use my personal resources for that to happen, which means that I, my own files, my own email addresses and everything to uh, basically activate the work, uh, mm -hmm. official work. And I felt that because I had all these documentation and all the things that, that had actually been leveled against me were not the case. I felt that uh, until such a time when the audit was over and investigation has been done, I would have to keep the repository because even when you give it away, you're not sure how it would be handled. And of course, if I'm called upon to uh, give evidence, then there's no the basis for that. I mean, and the funny thing is that, I mean, I had a, uh, an official vehicle, uh, a Toyota Land Cruiser, a, a, a Salon vehicle, and other items that I actually immediately handed over. Uh, so for me, I think that even when this report was going to be uh, done, there was a conclusion. I thought that as part of the audit process, the people who were being audited should get an opportunity to even see and then we get to the point answer, the to answer the questions which I had done, and then you duly uh, return the the item because at that point, then there was no need for further investigation. And I had indicated even to him that um, once it's over, um, I was ready to actually pay for it. So I was quite su surprised that, without recourse to myself, uh, the report had come out. But I mean, it's one of those things. I feel that. Uh, the state also has a responsibility to protect its citizens because whilst um, I was playing a particular role and these accusations have been made, it was important that I also uh, protected myself to make sure that all these allegations which are unfounded would be investigated. So I'm actually happy with the, uh, the final report which really suggests that all the things that were being said against my person was not the case. So I would um, engage my legal 
team and engage the auditor general and then get to the so bottom of the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is, as far as I'm concerned, it's not uh, a big deal. But you see, it also points to a general malaise. And I would have even expected that the audit would have extended to a certain administrative uh, lapse in terms of how an institution would not have a legal uh, department, there's no procurement department, there's no uh, substantive HR and all. So you go in there and you have to start working and you have to take decisions. And the report or the, even the audit report did not actually indicate that uh, they were suggesting or even making recommendations that these things are put in place. But it's a country that we are running. Uh, we are trying to make sure that the systems would work. So I will still offer my uh, my, cooperate my, yeah, I'll cooperate to with the team the to make sure that even apart from just get past the institution, other institutions that are lacking mm -hmm. in that, those administrative uh, processes will be able to be All given right. an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to do so. For instance, when I joined, I think a letter had already gone to the Public Services Commission that the authority itself had a deficit in terms of uh, personnel, about 54 essential stuff that were required to make the place fit for purpose as a, a modern day trade promotion organization. It didn't exist, you know, so you have to go through the processes and take decisions and uh, basically you live and die by the decisions that you take. But I'm happy that uh, there's absolutely no adverse findings against myself or anybody of, for that matter. Of course, it's a legal matter and so we would have to gets the legal advice of our to go, uh, through, the to go through the process. Okay, yes. Eric, I'm grateful. Felix, so uh, quickly on this, I mean, uh, public office is a living office and where to live what? Well, um, let me begin by saying that I, I believe in fairness. Mm. So I'm of the view that all processes need to be exhausted in these matters. And persons accused of any form of wrongdoing must have the opportunity to clarify or offer, offer clarifications where there's a need for one and have a fair hearing before judgment is passed. Indeed, the audit process itself is, has inherent in it such steps mm. to ensure that before a particular finding is made public, uh, every effort has been made to get the side of the person who is involved. Mm. Um, there are many, many instances where audit reports even get to Parliament's Public Accounts Committee, and you find that had some contact been established between those doing the auditing and those about whom the auditing was being done, uh, the issues perhaps could have been clarified before it, 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 it got there. There are, there are also several cases mm. where people have gone to court with audit reports and audit reports have been shut down because of the, the inability of the auditors to follow procedure. So that principle is one that I stand by and I cannot overlook simply because it involves uh, political opponents. That said, I disagree with Eric when he says that no adverse findings have been made against him. Indeed, the, 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 the part of the report that says that he is still in possession of a state assets, i.e. a laptop, is an adverse finding. There's also a part of the report that says that he, together with his colleague, uh, Saeed Wakil, I hope I got mm. the name right, and Madame Gifty Klenam, who was CEO, um, were paid clothing allowance up to 38,000 Ghana cities, even at a time when they had been removed from office no. as CEO. But that is but, in the report. But, you know, well, when, yeah, I like, so when I like, you can come in, of course. Yeah, you have but, the I mean, I think that uh, okay. no, you but gave me an so opportunity let, let me to land, clarify. Me if, it, if it happens... Oh, so like let, let me land and okay. then you come in. No, okay. uh, yeah, you, let me land and then you come in. I feel that I believe in fact. I won't make allegations against you without basis. I've seen a set of reports where it is captured that yourself, your former colleague, Akilu, and your former boss, uh, Madame Gitti Klenam, were paid clothing allowance of the, up to 38,000 cities, even when you had left office. No. Well, that is what the report is saying. Now, you must also appreciate that this is not the first time that we are hearing of alleged wrongdoing at GEPA. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the reason why Eric is out of office or has left GEPA, and Akilu is not there, and Madame Gitti Klenam are not there, is that there was an initial accusation that they had taken more than they were due in terms of rent allowance, and that they had done more travels than were necessary. I think that at a point it was alleged that 
uh, Eric and Gifty mm -hmm. combined had done about 60 trips yeah, outside the country. Uh -huh. And the... Those were allegations. Yeah, they were allegations. Yeah. But in fact, they were allegations that formed the basis for their removal. No, but that's... that's but, but, see, yeah. so, so when he says that no adverse findings have been made against this is an audit report. And as it's a final audit report. It's not a draft report. It's a final audit report. The next process is that it will go to Parliament for uh, Parliament's Public Accounts Committee to review it. They will call those about whom these findings have been made to hear from them. And if they are not satisfied with the answers, they can escalate it to a tribunal or court where legal processes can be brought against people like Eric and those named in the report. So I'm surprised that he's taking the view that no adverse findings have been made against him. Mm. Having said that, I think that Eric himself needs to learn from this process. You see, he and others in the MPP have made a song and dance and a dance about some audit reports, the basis upon which some NDC people have been dragged to court. I can assure you that there are many of those audit reports where the very process that he laments was used against. Where state institutions do not have... No, it's not that. It's not that. He has made the point that the auditors did not reach him after they had drafted their reports. It is a fair point. But I'm saying that there are many instances where NDC functionaries, some of whom are in court today, had claims made against them in audit reports by private audit firms who did not get in touch with them for their side of the story before going public. Indeed, I know of people who have been made to go to Yoko several times only to find that the answers that Yoko was looking for was right there staring in their face. If they had looked in the proper direction, if the auditors had only gotten in touch with the people about whom these uh, uh, reports were written, they would have found it. Again, Eric has often recited corruption allegations against people in the NDC. <laughs> has he not? Yeah. One of the things that he likes saying is that uh, President Mama used to re uh, what do you call it, reassign people who allegations of corruption were made against to the Flagstaff House. You've heard him. In fact, he said it on this program a number of times. Today, there are allegations of corruption against him, and he is at the Ministry of Information. He has been removed from GEPA, and he's at the Ministry of Information. Should we say that President Mama, sorry, President Akufuado also reassigns people as a reward for engaging in acts of corruption? So I am a stickler for due process. I am a stickler for fairness. And I think that whatever opportunities are available to him to clarify the issues and clear his name, he should pursue it. But he should not dismiss it and say that uh, no adverse findings against because these are not <laughs> okay. mere allegations. Well, the uh, Auditor General's report, the report is a conclusive has a, report. State property with him. Okay. Exactly. Right. So Henry, must, quickly, uh, come in and move, move so, on. We we must wrap it right. Right. Uh, so. uh, then we move no, on. Yes. I, mm -hmm. I absolutely have no qualms with Felix trying to take a pot shots at me. But that's what I'm saying. But you see, I have absolutely, I have absolutely nothing to to hide. Um, that's why I'm sitting here. Um, I believe strongly that um, the process would be uh, activated to its logical conclusion. Um, I would engage. Uh, and like I said, really, um, at a point where all manner of things had been leveled against myself, my person, including breaches and all of those things. I am happy that the uh, point of now I don't need to submit any further evidence to the effect that really I didn't do anything wrong. And now this is a democratic state. I mean, I believe strongly that once that is done, my name will be cleared. I have absolutely nothing to, to, to hide. I'm grateful. You see, I, I don't intend to drag this. By, uh, yeah, but I, 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 but I, see, I, am, I am moving on. Yes, but it's important. I'm not taking pushers. I'm hitting 730. I'm, I'm not taking... I, Eric, I feel like right, I just, a, just a minute. I'm not taking pushers at Eric. No, I mean, it's not in my nature Ten to seconds. go attacking him. No, but but if, I, if that is the route you want to... It's not a route. It's not a route. I could do similar. You see, the point is that... No, but he gave me an opportunity to clarify. Felix, you have been talking about it. But for President Mohammed has been talking, I want us to take a look at that. I don't have a lot of time. I'm sorry. Now, the former president has been talking about the parties at the party 27th um, anniversary, and he says that unlike the NPP, the NDC delivers on its promises when voted into power. We are not the same as the NPP. We have always stood by the truth. We have not told false promises just because we want political power. We tell people exactly what we can do, and when we come into office, we make our best effort to deliver exactly what we, we, we said we can do for them. The former president said at the party's uh, 27th anniversary lecture. Um, 
he says that uh, the NPP in the build up to 2016 uh, gave vain promises in order to win polls. Um, Eric, you, you are these promises vain? <laughs> the NPP's promises? Well, I'm actually quite surprised that um, the statement would actually come out from the former president. You mentioned uh, one dam, one village, yeah. and so, but several you see, It's also imperative that we contextualize this conversation. Mm. Yeah, and it's very necessary because, I mean, when it comes to the politicking, you can do the politicking, but the reality is also on the ground. I mean, the uh, flag bearer at the time, now president, uh, promised a free SHS, mm. uh, which he has delivered. He promised a one village, one dam, which is being delivered as we go, it's ongoing. Um, he promised to uh, digitize our port system by making sure that we go paperless. It's, it's been done. We have a single, in the last two years or so, just in the last few, uh, few months, delivered 1.2 million national identification cards. Um, the NHIA, which was meant to be uh, given a lot of money to be able to support his activities and the debts that were owed, that were actually crippling the NHI, those monies have been paid. Now you can sit in the comfort of your home and even um, activate your, your card and go on and, and so forth. Um, so there are all sorts of things that the president promised and has delivered. We are talking about uh, making sure that you, uh, the nursing and teacher training allowances were going to come back, it has happened. 100,000 uh, young people have had an opportunity to get employment under NAPCO. There's a series, a plethora of things that uh, were spoken about during the campaign that has been delivered. Now, you can have issues to do with, or you can even try and critique and say that maybe this is not to the levels within which you expected, or the expectations were extremely high, and these are legitimate uh, concerns, or if there's some kind of dissonance from the Ghanaian electorate, that is fine. Mm -hmm. But when it's coming from the NDC, and if you want to do a just a position in terms of the performance of the NDC vis-a-vis -vis that of the NPP administration, it's clear. We're talking about even the economy. Uh, the economy at the time was growing up when the NPP took over was 3.4 percent. Now we are, we are growing well in excess of seven on average since we took over. Uh, there to GDP rate. I mean, they, they, they keep going on about the fact that the government has borrowed and everything. But when you look at the, the trend and even the basis, the, the fundamentals in terms of how the economy is doing. This economy is on the right trajectory. Um, import cover was less than three weeks. It's we close to four months as we speak. Our policy rate at the time when we took over was 16%. Uh, 22% now it's 16%. And all sorts of things. I can name all of these things. Mm. So for me, I think that um, you can give him that right. I mean, it's uh, political season, uh, he would go and speak to his base and create the impression that nothing is happening. But if you're a parent today and hitherto uh, it was impossible for you to pay for your, your world to go to school and that child has an opportunity today, you'll be uh, grateful for that. You see, and a lot of people even when it comes to the, the free SHS, for instance, would say that, oh, uh, maybe some people can afford it, and why are you not letting them? And I've always maintained that. In the event that you can even afford, where parents basically use all their salaries or resources to be able to take these kids to school, now you can use the money for something else. We've been in school with kids where they didn't even have proper uniforms by virtue of the fact that all the money that the parent had was to, to, to pay school fees or even the parent having an opportunity to, to save some money to be able to uh, uh, make ends meet and even going forward to make some small property for retirement and all of those things. So these are conversations that you can discount and for political purposes decide that you would want to uh, uh, even think that it doesn't exist. But the people, the good people of this country have seen all of these things. Mm -hmm. One of their biggest things is the 1D, 1F, for instance. But as, as I speak to you, you, go, you drive around the country, you go to several uh, places in this country, and these things are 
in existence. You know, so they'll try and go and uh, make up all sorts of things. But really, in terms of even what our manifesto said, in terms of what the 1D, 1F would be, it stated categorically that it was going to be a collaboration between the private sector and government. So all of these things are happening. What NEIP has done in terms of giving support to young entrepreneurs, um, disabled uh, people who are into entrepreneurial activities, women, all of these things. It's so uh, there's a, a, a gamut of things that I can, I can point to. But like I keep saying, if for one reason or the other, any citizen of the state, uh, especially when we are uh, operating in the confines of, of, of a, demo, a, a democracy, mm -hmm. says that um, I'm unhappy with X, Y, Z, or maybe I thought that this would have been done much better. That's well within their rights. But in a political contest where there's a conversation between an MPP government and that of the NDC, mm -hmm. and you look at all these things that I've actually mentioned, it points to an economy that is on the right trajectory. And then they are watch. Agriculture and uh, industry were at, at some points during the, the tenure growing in the negative. As we speak, planting for food and jobs is giving an opportunity to farmers to be able to increase their output. Agriculture is growing in the region of around 7.5%, 8% industry. So for me, I think that, well, I mean, when it comes to economics, it comes to facts, you can't change it. Okay. Right, but it's also well within the rights of people. And even the former president is a citizen of this country. He mm. can he can criticize. But when you want to do a comparison, and then you go on a backdrop of or some promises have been made. We sat in this country when the NDC made promises that they were going to do a one-time premium of the NHIS. It didn't happen. There's so many examples. Things that happened with SADA, for instance. We paid money to, well, in essence of 200 million Ghana cities, a seed capital and everything. Nothing came out of it. So there's so many things that we can point to. You can do the politics, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the truth of the matter is, on the ground, as we speak today, even in the uh, 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 SHS sector, where last week the Ministry of Education actually brought out a list of 804 different facilities and amenities that are being built at the secondary school to support the free SHS thing. We have also employed close to 9,000 teachers to support that. So you can discount it, okay. you can say all sorts of things, but there are people, there are very, every single sector within the economy has seen Results. Uh, results. Okay. And it, I mean, okay. but like I'm saying that in this dispensation, people have the right to <laughs> criticize, to say all sorts of things that, but the reality on the ground is that it's a government that promised all of these things and is delivering. Okay, grateful. So, Felix, so SHS is there, one village, one dam, uh, port, uh, paperless system, NHIS, uh, teacher allowance, nurse allowance. The economy is, uh, is shooting up. Um, right. You know, we say in our, in our parlance, <coughs> book no lie, right? Um, again, uh, in our parlance, I would say that we were sitting our somewhere mm. when President Akufuado brandished a manifesto and stood on political platforms and said that this was his social contract to the people of Ghana mm. and that if voted for, he would do A, B, C, D. It was on that basis that people went to queue on the morning of December 7th, 2016, to vote for him. It was not because he was better looking than President Mama, or he was taller than President Mama, or people thought that uh, he was a better human being than President Mama. People took him for his word and decided to give him an opportunity to do what he said he would do. That is the only basis upon which we politicians convince the electorate to vote for us, nothing more. Now, if you look at that manifesto that President Kufado brought, he made a total of 281 promises in that manifesto. And I have the full list here. I can finish you with it. I can give it to you to verify. 281. So we expect that based on these 281 promises, at the end of the day, when we come to do an analysis of what has been done, we see the delivery of 281, or very close to that, so that everybody becomes clear, or is clear, that at least they have made the very best efforts they could to fulfill these promises. The president and his own vice president have, in recent times, stood on platforms and said, 
that they have achieved 41 promises. Is that not so? They have said it. If you Google it, you will see. So you make <coughs> 281 promises to the people of Ghana. And these can be verified from the MPP manifesto. Then, almost three years into your administration, you are only able to account for 41. That is, even if we accept that the 41 have been fulfilled but in the manner. Oh, oh, Eric, 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 you, you hold on. Eric, you, please look, I, I have a full list of it. Surely, I'm not going to be able to read 281 promises on this program. Yeah. But I'll read some of them to you if you. If you why, we you actually have, promised. We don't have a lot of time. Exactly, you, you, you actually go. promised to set up a technology park in each district. You have not done that. Which is ongoing. Please, 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 please. Let me make my point. You understand me? So. If you assess what they say they have done, 41, against what they promised, that is a conversion rate of 14.1%. It means that they have fulfilled only 14.1% of the promise that they, do, they give to the people of Ghana. So there's an outstanding 86% that remains to be fulfilled. By any stretch of the imagination, this is an absolutely appalling performance. Mind you, the manifesto that they brought was supposed to last for four years and nothing more. Because, and they were fully aware of it when we were making the promise. Now, even those 41, when you go to assess the quality of delivery, you find that there too, there are huge shortfalls. For instance, they promised to build a factory in each district. At the time that we were making the promise, there were 216 factories. Now, they have 254. You let's say that we can only hold them to what they said. So, 216 factories. When we probed further and indicated that, no, this promise appears rather lofty. How are you going to be able to deliver it? They splashed a map on us. Indeed, when I came here, I showed this to Eric. This is a map that the MPP drew. And if your ca cameras can capture it. They showed every district what factory was going to be put there, what raw materials were going to be used, and how many people would be employed. In fact, Eric informed me offset that he actually put up a billboard of this somewhere on the streets of Accra, <laughs> to reinforce Diabolics. that promise. Diabolics. That was a private Diabolics. conversation. Oh, no, but it's, it's a matter of public knowledge. Okay. So really, I'm, it's not like I'm, I'm really okay. written on okay. okay. So this is the promise they made. So if you want to see whether they have fulfilled the one district one factory, you just pick this map, and you go district by district and compare what they have done to this. You know, in terms of new factories, and indeed when they said they were going to establish factories in conjunction with the private sector, what it meant was that they were going to establish new factories. There was no mention of existing factories. But what they have done is that they've gone around and taken existing factories and put billboards or signboards indicating one district, one factory, and are claiming that those are the factories that they built. Meanwhile, this is what you promised. When you do an assessment, less than 10 factories have been built from scratch. Meanwhile, you promised 260. So you cannot pass it off as fulfillment of this promise. It is non-fulfillment, and you must acknowledge that. They also promised one village, one dam. At the time they were promising it, they said that this would be done in the three northern regions at the time, northern, upper east, upper west regions. Look, in the upper west region alone, sorry, upper east region alone, there are 15 districts, each of which has at least 150 villages. So when you do the math, you are talking about more than 2,200 dams that are supposed to be constructed in the upper East region alone. When you question them, they tell you that they are working on 300. Even that 300 falls short of the 570 that pre uh, Vice President Baumia promised last year in March at a festival in the northern region. He said that in, 200, in 2018, they will build 570. Now, if you add up all of that, you expect a minimum of 6,000 dams in the three northern regions. So you promised 6,000 dams. And then you give us 300 dugouts. You and I know what dams look like. What they are doing now are dugouts. Even that, the numbers are so appalling that it comes nowhere near the delivery of that promise. One million per constituency. They promise that each year, and indeed there's video footage of Pre uh, Vice President Baumia categorically stating that the money will be given to the constituencies. Now, they have already it and said that they are using coastal development authorities to invest the money in infrastructure. Let us even grant that. What it means is that every year since 2017, $275 million will be pumped into that. If you add up what should go in the three years, it amounts to $825 million. So let us see whether they have done work commensurate with $825 million. They have not. Indeed, in 2017, nothing went. 
When the Minister for Special Development Initiatives, the one in charge of this project, was questioned, she said that the money for 2017 had expired. Miss me money 2017, 2018, 2019, which will add up to $825 million. When you are questioned, you tell me the 2017 money has expired. I can assure you that when you go, you won't get the equivalent of $275 million released each year. So that one too, they have bridged it. Now, again, you can only also assess them on the basis of what you've given them. Because they say, to whom much is given, much is expected. Is that not the case? The Bible says it, right? Look, since this government came to power, when you do an addition of the resources that they've had, we are talking close to 229 billion Ghana cities. I'm not talking money that they've borrowed. Total resources that they've had. They have added 80 billion Ghana cities to our public debt. In tax revenue alone, and I'm giving you an assignment, your producers Just can check. Oh, please, uh, why do you, it has not been the bank. Been look, look, that, look, if you want, oh, please, 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 198 billion Ghana cities. When you do the uh, subtraction, what do you get? 80 billion Ghana no, cities. No, so why are you? No, no, oh, no, no, please. No, no, no. I, I saw yes. Parliament. If you give me an opportunity, look, that's a report. Oh, listen, listen, you, listen, that's listen, a report. You, you, listen. Yeah. you can read the report. <laughs> and he has it. Oh, it's a strategy you, that they are using. Uh, your strategy to now is to destroy no, 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 uh, that's Eric, all. you allow him. Let me wrap up. Then I come to you. I can engage you. Look, I can engage you in a debate on the composition of the debt. In fact, that would that would reveal how dishonest you people were when you were analyzing our debt in 2016. So don't worry about it. In addition to that tax revenue alone, 2017, 2018, 2019, by the end of this year, all things being equal, they would, they would have had 113.5 billion Ghana cities in tax revenue alone. Our year revenue, 2017, 2018, they had 7 billion Ghana cities. If you add what they will get at the end of this year, all things being equal, it will amount to 12.3 billion Ghana cities. Grants, that is money that is given to us for free. They've had 3.7 billion Ghana cities. In addition to this, there is some other borrowing that has not gone on the public debt, but it is resource that has come to government. GMPC has had $200 million. They've taken $750 million in commercial loans. They borrowed $5.7 billion under ESLA and other loans. When you add all of that up, that is 229 billion Ghana cities. He speaks about free SHS. He speaks about one district, one factory. Even if we were to accept that they have done what they promised, and I have debunked it, I have shown you that they have not done it. You haven't shown it. Oh, I have. You have How many factories you have, have you built you from scratch? This you is haven't. your own map. The, the last count, the trade minister I'm telling you that it is not true. What they have done is okay. that they've gone to take existing factories, mm. and uh, as they claim that they are giving them stimulus. That is not what they promised the people of Ghana. What they promised the people of Ghana, which Eric put in a public domain in a billboard, is this thing that I'm holding. When you compare it to what they have done, you see that only about 10 have been built from scratch. Okay. Again, now, Felix, wrap up. Yes. They say free SHS. SHS. Wrap up. Let me uh, what, and then see, can free react. SHS, since they came to power, the total amount they spent on free SHS won't amount to $2 billion. Mm -hmm. Check their budgets. When you look at capital expenditure, which one district, one factory, one village, one dam, one million per constituency will come under, it amounts to $4.2 billion. And then nursing and teacher training allowances is about a billion. When you add all that up, that is about 7 billion Ghana cities. Oil revenue alone should have been able to take care of that with a difference of our 4 billion Ghana cities remaining. So they have not even touched tax revenue. Neither have they touched grants. And yet all they are able to show us is 7 billion Ghana cities worth of work. What happened to the 220 billion that is left? Okay. So I'm not sure how Eric and his people think that they can survive any debate over uh, promises. And again, finally on the economy, look. They know absolutely nothing about the good rates that we are. Indeed, let me go back to the first one. Why you take no, them and no, hold on, uh, uh, oh. Felix? Hold on with the economy so, because I'll come back. Okay, no, uh, no, Felix, hold on with the economy. I'll come back. Yes, yes. yes we we'll have time. So that we are not uh, time I shall we'll take some comments and then we'll come back. Hello, Bright. So we've received quite a number of messages this morning, but we'll quickly go through some of it. And the very first one says, "I'm not expecting Eric to agree to the allegations made against him and his colleagues. If it was the opposition involved, he would have been on the rooftop." 
jobs, he should be embarrassed. This is coming from John McCoy. Uh, this one also coming from Mystic Inside in Sawam says, this government has failed when it comes to our security and the economy. If this uh, lawlessness and insecurity continues, it will be a recipe for disaster. Our Nigerian brothers and sisters should be, uh, should be law-abiding foreigners on the land of Ghana. Uh, this is not a matter of attacking Nigerians because they are taking over Ghanaian businesses. It's a matter of strengthening the law which governs our business as Ghanaians because we shouldn't forget that our fellow Ghanaians are also living in Nigeria doing business as well and the young sent that one from and so on. Alaji Hamza from Pick Pick Farm says, um, interesting times we live in this country and wonders shall never end. We were told by President Nanado and the NPP government that they were coming into power to protect the public purse. But today, what are we seeing? Corruption everywhere. According to the survey that was done by CDD, 9.6 billion Ghana cities cannot account, uh, be accounted for from 2017 till date. This was a government that campaigned on corruption to power and it is now clear they lied their way to power and they cannot lie their way to govern. Ghanaians deserve better. Charles Nyame from Asaman Kese says the NPP in opposition made, it, uh, made so much noise and peddled wild allegations about corruption only to come to power and make a U-turn suggestion to Ghanaian that, uh, Ghanaians that those allegations were mere perceptions. The real corruption is what we are seeing today. NDC and NPP can never be the same. The former is honest and the latter is a courageous liar. Uh, tell Eric to stop talking about free SHS when Ghana is chopping last in the latest ranking. One village, one dam is a mess. When PP government should come again. Uh, this is from Negos from Bongo. Uh, this, um, okay, this one says, uh, we know the NDC will continue with the unnecessary noise, but it will not change anything because Elder Samuel Ofosuan Pofo is not about the law in the country. We should let NDC, uh, the nation wreckers, stay in opposition forever. DJ O'Malley sent that one from Gorso. This one says, can someone please tell former President Mahama that dugouts are better than guinea fowls flying to Burkina Faso? Planting for food and jobs is also better than SADA. As for free SHS, it is unprecedented. Nanado is far better than Mahama. Elias sent that one from Sakai. And those are some of the uh, messages we received this morning. Grateful, right. Aisha. Keep them coming. Eric, you can come in now. Right. Um, I think that even the issue to do with public debt, again, it's uh, a deliberate attempt by the opposition to churn those figures up. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to give. Felix, this report, but uh, he, he, yes, but and it, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. no, 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 I have so, a more complete listen, report. Listen, uh, this is the, okay. the but Minister of Finance. Let me, let me, but you have asked me to speak. You have asked me to speak. No problem. I have asked you to speak. But I hope that you have time to. Yeah, we'll have the time. Yeah, he had asked me to speak. You know, so, and it's clear. This, yeah, actually, this appendix actually tells you exactly all the borrowings that this government has done. For 2018? Yes, and okay. basically, so it's, a, it's an annual report that talks about the annual public debt report for the 2018 financial year. And this is something that is actually, there's an act that governs it. I think the 271 or so, that goes to 72, uh, Act 921. Mm. Basically, that talks about borrowings and other government debt management operations, guarantee and lending activities of government, and other arrangements entered into by government. And this report is available. Fellas apparently has it. Now, what they have done is that they've decided that they will take the, uh, the external uh, debt. Sorry, no. the figure in here is 73 yes. billion. Yes, okay. yeah, you understand. So they've taken the, um, what do you call, the external debt, which is basically in the USD denomination, mm. and extrapolated that against the current exchange rate, and then came out with a figure. You understand? But then even if you look at the report itself, some of these loans that are actually even being drawn down, some of them go as far back as 2005. Because when you have some of them that has a 30-year, 15-year, 20-year, 30-year period that you would actually use to draw down. So even some of the loans that are in there are loans that were actually contracted by the NDC administration. So to create an impression, to go out there and create an impression that President Akufuado 
has borrowed 80 billion. It's erroneous. And then what the monies have been used for is clearly there for everybody to see. Apart from that, this is a government that sat down and did absolutely nothing for a whole financial sector to collapse. It had to take this government to come in and try and protect the deposits of 1.8 million Ghanaians. You understand? So when they go out there and they start talking about figures and all of these things and create the impression that the uh, opposition at the time, now, well, as, now that we're in government, that during the elections mm -hmm. there was a certain conversation surrounding the uh, issue of uh, the public debt and the vice president, and this is basically what they quote all the time. But if you do a clear, even if you just take a cursory look between at the time the vice president said those things, where uh, our uh, industry was, were growing, was growing at a negative, our debt to GDP ratio was hovering around 72%, interest rate was high, inflation was high, around 15.4% at the time. All of these things. And then you do uh, a juxtaposition today and look at the trajectory that the economy is going, everything that he said at the time was correct. Because when all of these things, and then even when they have done all of these things, nursing training allowance has been truncated, teacher training allowance has been truncated, but they've taken us to the IMF, and even when they were taking us to the IMF, we, they, they didn't tell us the truth. They went all the way and said that we're going to go to the IMF to seek policy credibility. It, it turned out that we went to the IMF for a full-blown bailout. So all of these things, all the monies that had been borrowed at the time, the state of the fundamentals of the economy and the ex exigencies at the time pointed to the, an economy that was, had been run aground. So all the things that he said at the time was true. Now, you can talk economics and you can also talk politics. So when they bring it today where you have an economy, like I stated, all these things that point to an economy that's doing well, our credit rating has actually improved under the watch of President Akufuado. And then we've done all of these things. You see, when they took us to the IMA, for instance, as part of the conditions, young people who had left school four, five, six years did not have an opportunity to find employment in the public sector. It took an Akufuado government to come in and find work for these young people. Apart from that, even the requirements, the key requirements to be able to exit the IMF, they were not able to meet it. When you talk about it, they say, oh, that is not the case. That's the reason why people voted for you. But you couldn't okay. meet the, those requirements. And it's, it's a given that if the NDC were in power today, they would still be under the IMF condi uh, conditionality. So the, the, the evidence is there. When you talk about doom so, they say, oh, we solved it. But you see, the conversation around doom so should also be clarified. The NDC were in power in 2009. 2010, 2011, 2012, September, before we started experiencing doing so, we were in this country for almost three and a half years in the dark. Then you found uh, emergency uh, ways of trying to bring car power and Ameri and all of those, three and a half years. Mm. Now, I know that the conversation would even go into the energy sector. Then you go on there and sign all these IPP arrangements, where by virtue of even what we have done now, Ghana as a country is meant to pay $1 billion every year for power that it doesn't even use. That is the NDC for you. That was a sort of administration and governance that they bequeathed to the people of this okay. country. Eric, so I'm when we're having you. this conversation, devoid of the politics, mm. let's be candid with ourselves. So okay. a former president okay. who wants to come back to power can go and stand anywhere and say that, well, they promised all of these things. But you see, he has to also submit himself, subject himself to scrutiny and say that, listen, what did you do that is better than what is pertaining okay, to Eric, today? I'm grateful. So he says government has borrowed, but every uh, uh, indicator is showing positive. False. Every economic You see, thing. it's important that government spokespersons, first of all, they should be truthful. And they should find out what the accurate information is. Look, we have not said that President Akufadu has borrowed 80 billion. We have said that the public debt has increased by 80 billion. That is not true. Oh, you are the first person. You are the please. first person okay. to say this. Eric, we are here today. It's not true. <laughs> so, the minority <laughs> has issued two statements. Mm -hmm. In fact, they've held two press conferences in the last three weeks. Go and check both statements. There's no I'm way happy that, that you oh, admitted that. Oh, no, you see, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are going ahead of yourself. When I finish my submission, you will eat back everything you've said. We have said that the public debt has increased by 80 billion Ghana cities. Mm. 
Actually, President Akufuado has borrowed more than 120 billion Ghana cities. But some of it has been used to do reprofile, replacing existing debt. It is the rest and other factors that has accounted for the 80 billion. Let me show you how you can know that they borrowed more than 120 billion. Quickly. Look, go to the Ministry of Finance website as we speak. Your producers can check. The law requires the finance minister to send to parliament every quarter, that is every three months, a list of borrowings that he intends to do domestically. So when you go to the Ministry of Finance website, there's something they call issuance calendar, bond issuance calendar. Between first quarter 2017, and second quarter 2019, a total of 117 billion Ghana cities has been borrowed by the Akufuado government. All the figures are there. In fact, I have the documents. I can forward it to you. You can display it on your screen for your viewers to hear. If you add that to external borrowing, it crosses over 120 billion Ghana cities. Now, the distinction that he tries to draw exposes their duplicity that, and dishonesty. That, 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 let, let, me, let me give you some clues. So, so, so oh, Eric, 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 to explain. It was no, not, I, I, I've explained. I, 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 I look, explain. all of this is contained in the minority statement. Mm -hmm. Everything I've told you here. Look, again, Eric, when you were campaigning, you didn't make any distinction between undisbursed loans that were being disbursed under President Mama because there were loans that you took, like the Buidam loan, like the Eurojet 8 hospital uh, project, about 380 very million. Very oh, poor. please. Aren't you taking credit for the things that you are doing now? <laughs> there were so many on this best that were disbursed under President Mama. It added to our public debt. Today, they speak about exchange rate differential. Exchange rate differential affected us. Yes, Dr. Baumia stood on platforms and claimed that we had borrowed. He said we had borrowed. There's a video. You can show it. He didn't make any distinction. So no distinctions are allowed today in the debate. Unless you repudiate what you said in the past. No, Again, it's, it's oh, economic. please. Okay. But we're of course, but it's economics. Uh, it was economics then. We, uh, Again, you see, this noise that they make about the IMF. Look, when we went to the IMF in 2014 or 2015, it was the 16th time we were doing so. When President Kufo and his MPP were in power between 2001 and 2008, we went there twice. So going to the IMF is not necessarily an indication of very poor economic performance, as you would have us believe. Indeed, when they were in opposition, they promised that they would curtail that program. They extended by two years. It was only no, April this because year. Because you had it. Okay, oh, it's not true. Uh, five, right, look, five, look five, right, it is not true. It is true. Let you me tell you something. Go and read the IMF um, report. Hmm? Uh, I beg you, let me make this point. I'm grateful. The reason why they were able to get out of it is that they were given a waiver on the conditionalities that they needed to meet. It's not that they met it. They were, it was waived for them. It's like you fail an exam, but your teacher passes you anyway. No, that is, that is what happened that to them. So he should stop making okay. noise about IMF. It's unfortunate that we didn't have I had wanted us to talk about yes. uh, proceed on leave. Uh, a court yes, has ruled yes, yes. that it must stop. I guess yeah, it's we'll an important time. ruling. But it's a development yeah. uh, uh, But you need, to, so. you need to extend your time. Yes, it's simply we will. <laughs> Grateful for your time. Eric uh, Chum is a <laughs> spokesperson of the Ministry of Information, a member of the MPP's communication team. Felix Pachovosu is a member of the NDC, a former deputy minister. Grateful for your Monday morning with us. Stay here.